religious and having a relationship with God. Religion is not enough. Most everybody has a religion. I suppose you could even say that atheism is a religion of sorts. But a relationship with God is what people need, not just a religion. Secondly, we see here the condition of a nation under the judgment of God. Not only do we see the description of a nation who had turned their backs on God, we see the condition of a nation under the judgment of God. Verse 5, you still have your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 1? It says, why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a ship like a, a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. And the only reason that would happen right there, what is described there, is because they turned their backs on God. So they were under the judgment of God. Now, there are a lot of people in our country, and even in our churches, I don't know, I'm, I'm not singling out our denomination in particular, but, but I suppose there are people in, in every denomination like this. Uh, they would, they just, they just recoil, they just kind of react negatively to any suggestion that God today judges people. And that things that happen in our world may sometimes be a judgment because of sin. Can you believe that things that happen sometimes, even in our own personal lives, can be the result of the judgment of God? Or God withholding His hand of protection from us? Nobody believed that our nation could be attacked like we were on September the 11th of 2001. And then after it happened, people were asking why. And yet, for many years, We've been saying we don't want God in our schools, we don't want prayer, we don't want Bible reading, uh, we don't want God to be in the public arena. Keep Him in the church, keep Him in the four walls of the church, that's all right, but don't, don't let Him out. Don't let Him out into society. Well, God is everywhere, and you can't put God in a box, even if you try. You can't confine Him, and if we turn our backs on God, God will find somebody else who will serve Him. He will have a remnant, He will have a people who will serve Him. <coughs> And so we, we need to be, to realize that it's a privilege to serve God. So, they couldn't recognize the punishment God had inflicted upon them. Uh, and what about all the natural disasters in our own land in recent years? People, as I said, people don't want to hear that sometimes things may be the result of the judgment of God. The Israelites failed to see that the condition of their nation was the direct result of their sins and the rejection of God and His laws. They were suffering because they had uh, turned their back on God. Um, well, there are some long scriptures I could read about this. And, I, I, and I, I, the scripture really is better, I guess... Better for me to read the scripture than for me to give my own opinions about things. I'm not trying to give my opinions. I'm basing it on what I'm seeing here. But, you know, the enlightenment, enlightenment in our land will always give another reason for our troubles. But we only need to read what God told the children of Israel. He promised blessings for obedience and curses for, obe for disobedience. Let me just read a little bit of this. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we, we read this recently. I think Richard read this recently in one of... Uh, or part of this passage, maybe not these verses, but verses 13 through 28 talk about it. It says, if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today, God says to Israel, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Do we ever think of the fact that rain comes from God, that the blessings that we have in our country come from God? 
that when it rains and the sun shines and our crops grow, that it's because of God's blessings. And God says, when, it, uh, when you obey me, then even all of nature will, will bless you. Your crops will grow. You'll have the rain that you need. And when you don't, then you're going to experience the opposite of these things. And uh, the, the, you read that whole passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy 11, and it not only talks about the fact that God will bless us when we obey, but that we will experience curses when we don't. If you go down to verse 26 in that same chapter of Deuteronomy 11, he says, See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessings if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I commend you, that I command you by following other gods. God says, I'll bless you if you follow me and obey me, and then you'll be cursed if you turn away from me. Have you ever felt like things were going wrong in your life because you weren't, weren't obeying God? We've probably all felt that way sometimes. Doesn't it seem like things go better when you're living in a right relationship with God? Well, does that mean you're never going to have a flat tire on your car? Does that mean you're never going to get sick? Does that mean your refrigerator can't go out or your washer or your dryer? No, it doesn't mean those things. But I believe that somehow when we obey God, we, we experience blessings that otherwise we wouldn't experience. And when we're not obeying God, God has ways of getting our attention. Sometimes he has to get people flat on their back before they will even look up and trust him. Is every sickness from God? No, I wouldn't say that. But I think sometimes people get sick and they have to be flat on their back so that they will finally realize that they just can't make it on their own. They need God's help. And it's amazing how people often who don't serve God otherwise, when they're sick and in the hospital, they do want people to pray for them. Often people want the preacher to come and pray for them to get well when they're sick. And then when they get well, sometimes they forget about God till they're sick again. You don't think about having a fire extinguisher in your house until you have a fire, perhaps. But you should have it there anyway, right? Because you don't know when you might have a fire. How many, how many know for sure that you have enough air in the spare tire in your car? <laughs> All right. You must have had a flat tire lately or something. Um, how many check the air in the spare tire in your car? Did you ever do that? Some of you, if you were to go and look at your spare tire, you might find that it's way, way low. You haven't had a flat tire for a long time, so you don't think about your spare tire. But you ought to keep air in it just in case you have a flat tire. Now, when people are, everything's going good in life, sometimes people don't think about God. When things go bad, they think about God. But how about serving God all the time, in the good times and in the bad times? And if you serve Him all the time, then you won't have to feel guilt and, and worry uh, when things go wrong, because you'll know it's not because of sin in your life. It's not because of something you've done wrong. Every time you, something goes wrong doesn't mean you have done something wrong. Job had problems too. And Job's friends told him he must have done something wrong. But Job hadn't sinned against God. The devil was, was giving him trouble. And sometimes the devil gives us trouble. So, the Bible says that the nation of Israel was close to becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. Were Sodom and Gomorrah so much worse than some of our cities today? I don't know. We've got some pretty evil things going on in our country. And it's hard to, to believe that such, uh, such things are going on. Thirdly, we find in these verses the attitude of God toward a nation that is religious but not righteous. In verses 10 to 15. Still have your Bibles open to Isaiah 1. Look at verses 10 to 15. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord, I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. We 
when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Now what is God saying there? He's saying here are people who are continuing with all their religious uh, symbolism, but they don't have what it symbolizes. You can come to church on Sunday morning and sing the songs, read the scripture, have a nice little prayer, go through all the motions, put your money in the offering plate, but if you're not living for God, what good is all that going to do? That's not going to take the place of a relationship with God. And sometimes the further and further people get away from a real relationship with God, the more they want religion. The more they want ritual. They're not comfortable with anything where there's any expression, where there's any emotion. They just want ritual. But ritual, God says, will not do what is needed. God will not be pleased with you putting your offering in the offering plate and singing the psalms and praying the prayers unless your heart is right with Him. So when we know that there's something wrong, the remedy is not to go to church and go through the ritual. The remedy is to get your heart right with God and you don't have to go to church to do that. Now I'm not saying you, um, you can stay out of church and be right with God. That's not what I'm saying at all, unless you can't go. I know we've got shut-ins that can't go to church. I was listening to a country song one day, and it, had, and it talked about all the things. It was an old country song, uh, one from the 70s, I guess, or 80s. And uh, the, the singer was, there was a phrase in there, and at first I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, understand what he was saying. I listened to it a few times. And finally, he was talking about things he did believe in and things he didn't believe in. And he said that he didn't believe that that uh, heaven was only for those who congregate. It was something like that. The phrase was, I don't believe that heaven's only for those who congregate. And it rhymes with other things in the song. And what he was saying is, oh, but heaven is not just for people that go to church. Well, maybe not. But heaven is just for people that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if they know him as their Savior, they want to congregate with other believers. Amen? If you're a Christian, you should want to meet with other Christians. If you're a Christian, you should want to hear the Word of God. If you're a Christian, you should want to sing the songs and praise to God and pray. So, yes, worship is important, but it can't take the place of a relationship with God. Just the ritual itself won't be enough. And God plainly tells that to the nation of Israel. He does not accept their worship. He is not pleased with their rituals. He does not measure success the way people do, the way man does. He will not hear their prayers. Now, what does that mean? He can't, can't hear them? Oh, he can hear them, but it means he's not going to pay attention to them. He's not going to reward them for disobedience. So is God going to hear the prayers of people when they only pray when they're in trouble? And when they don't have any relationship with Him, God does not promise to answer prayers for those who are not His children. If your children need something and ask for you for something, you're going to do your best to help them, right? But if somebody on the street, somebody else's child walking down the street says, I need $10, when you're walking down the street, you won't feel quite as obligated to give it to them, do you? Your children mean something special to you, and you're going to help them out. And God says, my children, those who follow, trust in me, and those who know Jesus, those who have faith, those who are in a relationship with me, I'm going to hear their prayers. But if you're rebelling against me and walking the other way, don't expect your prayers to be answered. Except the prayer of repentance. That's the only prayer God promises to hear of the, of the sinner. The sinner really doesn't have the right to go to God and ask for things. Any more than some total stranger on the street comes up, has the right to come up to me and ask for the same things that my daughter or my wife would. My own family, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet their needs. I'm going to do everything I can to help them. They're my family. Now, if I see somebody else in need, I'd like to help them, but I can't help everybody, but I have a responsibility to my family. And God doesn't promise to hear the prayers of unbelievers, except the prayer of repentance. And then, we also see here the love and mercy of a God who 